Oh, my point did the wrong board. Well, did it work? Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Yeah, so just so everybody knows, on video, kind of new to making these videos and learning how to how this goes, how to how to, and I try to keep everything real simple. I don't want a lot of crazy stuff on my on my videos or my website. I want to keep it simple. I want to get you the information you need to know. Um, and I'm learning because I'm using my Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra. It's got that smart pen, and I'm learning using the smart pen there. I got a, I got a crappy LG phone one. I should have got one like that. Yeah, these are these are really great phones. It has a really great camera. And you know what? They got really good cameras. I this thing, I can probably zoom in from here to the end of the wall, and it looks like crap. Yeah. Well, yeah. I I like that. Photography phone. is one of my hobbies. I should bought one of those phones. And uh, the camera on here is just excellent, and it's really great for video too. So I learned how to use this smart pen to start to stop it. It keeps my big old belly out of the frame when I'm stopping it. When we have to take a break. We're going into fire hydrants. Okay. Fire hydrant study guide. Okay, so there are two types of fire hydrants used in a water system. A wet barrel hydrant is always pressurized and the main valve is in the top of the hydrant barrel. A dry barrel hydrant has the valve at the bottom of the barrel and a drain hole that drains the barrel when the hydrant is closed. These hydrants are used in areas where freezing occurs in the winter. Now, here in our area, in our utility, we only encounter freezing temperatures for brief periods of times, maybe once or twice a year. We're in the desert. It does get very cold in the desert at night, depending on the time of the year. Um, but freezing temperatures, it, where we're at, it only happens maybe once or twice a year on average. It's not the biggest problem that we have, but, but because of that, most of the fire hydrants in our system are a dry barrel hydrant. So the valve, to fill the hydrant full of water to energize the hydrant, the valve is several feet below ground, the hydrant berry, right? So the hydrant berry is the distance from grade to the valve at the bottom. And that's an important point to make. Um, so when this hydrant is open, when we open that valve through the nut, the operating nut at the top, this is a wet barrel hydrant, this is a dry barrel hydrant. They all, you could have, they could look different, but this is the basic idea. I mean, if you look at a wet barrel, you can certainly tell there's a difference between a wet barrel and a dry barrel. And on the dry barrel, the operating nut is up here at the top. By turning that, you can open the valve, the foot valve, which allows water to fill the head of the hydrant, energize it so we have water available out of the pumper nozzle or the two, two and a half inch nozzles on the side there. As soon as you open that valve, a drain hole opens up. So when you, when we operate these hydrants, we have to open them all the way. Until it's open all the way, the drain hole is going to be leaking water. It's going to be, and it's pressurized, so it's going to be forcing the water out. And it could degrade the foundation. It could undercut a sidewalk or pavement, depending on where the hydrant is. So when we operate these valves, you can very simply, leaving the caps on, you can open it all the way. Um, if we, and, and nothing, it'll, it'll, it'll drain out of the drain valve until you open it all the way and it closes the drain valve. Now you have an energized fire hydrant. If you have it closed all the way and you open up one of these ports, you can put a gate valve on there or a pressure gauge, a gate valve with a pressure gauge adapter. You can put any type of, type of uh, we often use these to flush with. We'll flush directly out of the pumper nozzle or we might put on something that we can attach a gate valve to and then a hose. So if I take off one of these, I attach a gate valve, I can close the gate valve all the way. And from that, I can attach a hose or a pressure gauge, something else. I can, with, with these closed off and a gate valve attached here, I can open this nut all the way, the operating nut, energize the hydrant, 
And then when I want water, I can just simply open the secondary gate valve and to get pressure or to flush the system. And we've been using hoses to do that, right? You have diffuser nozzles that could be put on the other side of that. So that secondary gate valve allows you to operate the hydrant without having to fully open it and then fully close it and not have that kind of control because it takes a while, right? It takes a while to open up that operating or that foot valve with the operating net. Um, a relatively quick and inexpensive and effective method of thawing a frozen hydrant is to inject live steam into the hydrant. And that's something that we don't do here. We're in the desert, we're in Arizona. Uh, the few instances of freezing that, we, that occur, they don't typically cause us any problems, even for our customers at their own uh, residential services or commercial services. So we, that's not really a problem for us, but in other parts of the country where it commonly freezes for long periods of time, they might go and inject live steam into the hydrant to thaw it out. As we know, as water freezes and solidifies and becomes ice, the ice expands and it can blow out a main. I happened to be in Oklahoma one Christmas when the water main froze uh, Christmas morning and it took them four or five days to repair that under freezing conditions in Oklahoma. It took them four or five days to fix it before water is available to the customers again. <clears throat> Never operate a dry barrel hydrant with the main valve cracked to throttle flow. The drain hole will be open anytime the main valve is not completely open. The release of water through the drain hole will undercut the sidewalk and the hydrant. We just, look, we just talked about that. This is a good little diagram too of where the foot valve is. Down below, this is for a dry barrel hydrant. Once you open that, it charges this hydrant. Once we close the operating nut, the drain hole will drain out all the water that's in the hydrant to protect it. If a throttle flow is needed, a secondary gate valve should be attached to the hydrant nozzle. With the hydrant valve wide open, the gate valve can be used to throttle the flow. Hydrants should be properly buried to the marked berry line on the lower uh, barrel, just below where the lower barrel connects to the upper barrel. Uh, proper berry depth is important because if the hydrant is stuck, it's more likely to break safe. If it's struck, it's more likely to break safely. What that means is, and we've had this happen several times just in the last few months, somebody runs off road, hits our hydrant. That hydrant is designed to break at a certain point. If it breaks at a certain point, it it's more, typically it's easier to repair and rebuild. Uh, if we have to, we gotta replace it. We had one hydrant that was just completely destroyed recently and we had to replace the whole thing. But that hydrant berry, is the distance from here to grade. And that's necessary because that hydrant, if struck by something, it will, uh, it will break more cleanly. There's components in place that will allow, will break first before the rest or other more expensive parts of the hydrant breaks. Fire hydrants should never be placed on lines smaller than six inches. If they are to be used for fire protection, and that's the key point, you can put a fire hydrant on a four inch line, but it's only good as a blow off. It's not really good as a fire hydrant or as a, for use for fire purposes, for fighting fires. Um, hydrants can also be useful for flushing lines, venting lines as they are filled and pressure and flow testing. You have to understand that when the pipe is empty and we want to charge it, that pipe is full of air. And because we have to protect our water, our potable water supply, before a main, a water main, for example, goes into service, we test it. We pressurize it and test it to make sure that it'll hold water, that it doesn't have any leaks. We don't want water leaking out of those pipes in our distribution system, and we don't want infiltration. We don't want water getting forced into our pipes. So we make sure that they're watertight. Then when we go to energize that system, we're, put, we're filling it with potable water, treated water. 
and all that error has to be displaced. So what we might do is go to the end of the line, open up the hydrant, and that allows the air to escape as the water main is being pressurized or, act or charged. Um, we use these for flushing lines. So throughout our system, we want to flush out our system, 20% of our system every year. So over the course of five years, 100% of our system has been flushed. Even though it's an enclosed system, it's protected, it's watertight, it's pressurized and tested, and even though we have all this sediment still builds up in the water, remember in, out here, in our utility, we use groundwater as our, as our water supply. And with groundwater is gonna come little bits of sand and sediment that's gonna settle in the distribution pipe. Now remember, under normal conditions, once the distribution main, once these mains are charged, the water doesn't really move very quickly. Once it's charged up and full, if somebody goes to wash dishes and they open up their faucet at their kitchen sink, a little bit of water get, leaves the pipe and it's replaced immediately by more water that's in the pipe and we keep it pressurized. We wanna keep it between 20 PSI is the minimum. 70 PSI is really the limit that we want to be at. Any more than that, it can start to cause damage to water appliances at the customer's home. Water softeners, water heaters, things like that. So <clears throat> our operating range is somewhere between 20 and 70. 20 is the minimum. And one reason why 20 PSI is the minimum is because it keeps water from, if there is some type of leak where water can leak out, if the pressure in our distribution system falls below 20 or 20 psi that means any water outside of the pipe can get back in so we want to keep that from happening um, as the water fills the pipe it's pushing that air we either use the fire hydrant or an arv to uh, release that air if air is left in the line it reduces the diameter of the line remember air we use it in our tires, right? At a certain PSI, because air can be pressurized. If we have a bubble of air in our distribution system, say at a high point, because air always wants to go to the highest point and that's where it gets trapped. So if there's air in the line, it's always gonna find the highest point. If we have no way to release that air out of there, it's gonna build up. And the water, it's gonna act, even though it's air, it's gonna act as the side of a pipe. It's gonna reduce the diameter or the volume that the pipe can hold. And that's bad. We don't want that. It changes the water pressure that goes to the customer. If we have a high point that has a big bubble of air in it and it won't and it can't escape, on one side of that, the pressure to the customer might be 60 PSI, and those customers are really happy. On the other side of that, on the downstream side of that, we might have customers who are saying, hey, my water pressure is at 15. Well, now we don't have problems. We have a problem because we can't maintain water pressure downstream of that. We got to get the air out of that pipe. And we do that commonly by flushing the system with fire hydrants, placing a fire hydrant at that point, or more cost effective method is an ARV, an air release valve, a combo unit. And what that does, an air release valve, especially a combo unit, is one that allows air to escape. When it builds up, it allows the air to escape. If there's no air in the line, it closes off and it doesn't allow the water out. If there's a main break or we shut off the pumps, we have to empty the lines, it allows air to come into the pipe because as you move the water out of the pipe, it needs air to replace it. If you don't replace the empty space with air, you have a vacuum and a vacuum will cause the pipe to crush from inside. Okay, so <clears throat> as we were saying, hydrants on smaller lines, four inches and less, will not supply enough water to fight a fire, but may be used to flush the dead end lines. A dead end line, so we have two types of systems. You have a loop system or a tree. And if you think of the branches of a tree, you have a trunk going up, that's the main or the distribution main, and it branches out. It branches out to dead ends, like the limbs of the tree. If you have a system like that, then sometimes you just can't avoid it. 
you want a fire hydrant at the ends of those. So periodically you can go in there and open up the fire hydrant and flush out that water. Remember water is only good for a short period of time before it starts to go bad. We call that water age. So if you imagine you have a home, if you imagine, and I'll just use this space to, if I have a water main that comes off and it's moving water through the system, I'll have a piece of a pipe that is teed in and then maybe it runs down to a cul-de-sac and there's homes along the line. Whoops, all of a sudden I can't draw a house. Let's try it this way. So I have this street or a cul-de-sac. And on both sides of that street, I have homes, residences. We have a line, a distribution main <clears throat> that runs down that street and provides water to each of these residences or customers. So as the water comes down and branches off, it's providing water to these residences, but right here we have a dead end. The water stops, it's plugged. Hopefully there's a fire hydrant there. And let's see if I can draw something that looks like a fire hydrant. <laughs> Very <laughs> ugly. But let's call that a fire hydrant. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the water at this point is going to start aging. Remember, water doesn't move very quickly through our water distribution system. It moves slowly. Somebody in this house opens a faucet, a little bit of water goes that way, and it's replaced right away. This water is not moving. It's stuck at the end of the line. Very soon, the dissolved oxygen in the water is going to be depleted. It's going to leave the water. It's going to off-gas. Then the water becomes stale. Doesn't, if you were able to taste it, it wouldn't taste quite right. It would taste kind of stale. As time passes, that water is going to become septic. Bacteria is going to start growing in there. Um, it's going to become septic, which leads to hydrogen sulfide production. Hydrogen sulfide, if you smell it, it smells like rotten eggs. Okay? So every once in a while, you need to go out to this system open up that fire hydrant to flush out the water and freshen up the water in that entire line. So this is from a branch system. In a loop system, you have a water main, dang, a water main that brings water to a big loop. The water comes in and ideally you have water coming in from two different sides of this loop. So the water comes in, energizes all the pipe. There's customers all around and throughout this system. There might be even streets in between, customers in between, but basically the water never stops anywhere. There's no dead ends. So the water is constantly moving. Every time somebody opens a faucet, starts doing their laundry, taking a shower, the water is constantly moving and being replaced with new fresher water. I should say with fresher water. So there's two types of system, the tree, the looped, the looped is ideal. On a tree system, you want a fire hydrant at the end to be able to flush out the water periodically. You got a question? Cul-de-sacs, are they typically dead ends? Yeah. Typically. Typically. Typically they're dead ends. So we might have a blow off at the end or a fire hydrant that allow us to flush out the water. Sometimes the, the, the main extends through the cul-de-sac into the next cul-de-sac on the other side or into a, a neighborhood or a system that's on the other side of that. So just because you see a cul-de-sac doesn't mean it's a dead end. Mm -hmm. 
And that's one reason why we have our, our, our GIS, a graphical information system. So that's a big map of our system. Shows every street, every residence, every service connection, every water meter that's out there. It starts at the, ideally it starts at the well site. It shows where the well site is and it gives you information. If you click on it, it'll give you information. It'll say, okay, this well site uh, produces this much water. Right now it's running. Maybe now, it, well, now we're getting into SCADA, but a GIS system identifies where your infrastructure is, how big it might be, uh, how much water's flowing through it, if it's on, you know, things like that. So um, that information is gonna say, and it's gonna show you the map of your system, and it's gonna say, well, at this cul-de-sac, the water main runs through it and goes out to the other side to a loop system. It's part of a loop system. Um, I can think of one neighborhood in particular out here where once you go in the gate, because it's a gated community and these are very expensive homes relative to other homes in our area, it's just cul-de-sacs. One after a set of cul-de-sacs everywhere you go, every street is a cul-de-sac on either side, all the way down to the end, and that system is a tree or branched. It's dead ends on every one of them. So periodically we need to go through and flush out those dead ends so we don't get complaints from there. And not just because we don't want complaints, but because we want to protect the water supply. Yeah. It's our first job. Our first responsibility is to protect the health and safety of the customer. And if we know we have these dead ends out there where water is potentially going septic, that's not good. It's not good for our customer's health. We're not doing our job. Well, that was a bit cold. Well, let's go back here because I'm not sure if I touched on all those points. Um, hydrants must be installed with the nozzles at least 18 inches above grade. Why is that, George? Because the fireman can't open up the fire hydrants and pull the caps off. Yeah, I gotta remember that the hydrant wrenches are about 15, 16 inches in length. I think the standard is 15. 18 inches. And so are they 18? Is that the standard? 18 inches. 18 inches is the standard? Okay. George just taught me something. Now George is my facilitator of our fire hydrant maintenance program. He's our expert in our department. So, um, yeah. So if it's not at least 18 inches above grade and there's a fire, fireman goes there, puts his valve wrench on there and goes to open up the nozzle, what's gonna happen? If it's not at, what, at 18 inches, you're just whacking grade every single so time. So he's gotta so turn it, take the wrench off, put it back on, turn it. Yeah, that's, so. That's slowing him down. That's slowing him way down. We don't want that. We wanna, if there's a fire and the fireman is there, we want him access to that water as soon as possible. <clears throat> so the 18 inches, that's the clearance that's needed for the fireman to open the hydrant, or just us when we're doing maintenance on it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Fire hydrants. So the different colors of fire hydrants, when you see, in our system, we don't do this. In other systems, I mean, where I was over the weekend, I took a little trip yesterday, an overnight trip, and I saw a fire hydrant, the pumper nozzle was green. They didn't paint the, the bonnet. But they painted the cap, the cap, the uh, the pumper nozzle, <clears throat> and it was painted green, and that told me right away that it was because it's a one thousand to one thousand four hundred ninety nine GPM fire hydrant. Every fire hydrant, part of our PM process, is to touch the flow. We want to ensure that that fire hydrant is constantly is somewhere in one of these categories. If it has a black bonnet, it's out of service. If it has, uh, if it's, first of all, if the fire hydrant's yellow, if overall it's yellow, that's part of the public water system. If it's silver, it's typically private, right? Um, and again, not every system follows every one of these, but this is a general guideline. Um, if it's blue, 1,500 gallons per minute plus. Red, it's less than 500 or less than 499 gallons per minute. 
it's important to be familiar with these two when you are in a system. And even though we don't do it in our system, it's good to know, especially when you're taking the certification exam, you want to understand what these colors represent. Okay, yellow hydrant body with a green cap. It's gonna be, let's see, you just cover that 1,000 to 1,499 gallons per minute. Very good. What should be installed between a water main and a fire hydrant? An heat auxiliary valve. Auxiliary, yep. So that's an isolation valve. Thanks. You have the water main running down the street. There's a T that branches off to the fire hydrant to supply the fire hydrant with water. At that T, you want an isolation valve. We use gate valves. There's a gate valve that we, once we open it, now there's water available to the fire hydrant. If we close it, we're isolating off that fire hydrant. We call that an auxiliary valve or an isolation valve. Yellow hydrant body with an orange cap. B, 500 to 999 gallons per minute. Okay, 500 to 999 gallons per minute. Very good. The operating valve for a wet barrel hydrant is located on the head. On the head. B. B. On the head. Very tough. Yes. Always operate a dry barrel hydrant with the main valve fully open. Is that true or false? Uh, fully, you need to be true. true. Fully open. True. And if you don't want water spilling everywhere as you open up the hydrant, just put on a secondary gate valve. Put a yeah. secondary gate valve on, you take off the cap, and this is before you open the hydrant, take off one of the caps, put a secondary gate valve on there, close it, open up the valve all the way. Once the valve is open all the way, then you can throttle the flow. You can open that gate valve a little bit to let a bit, little bit of uh, small flow out or all the way open to get the full GPMs that hydrant is rated for. If you must throttle the flow from a hydrant, Adrian, B, attach a secondary gate valve to the hydrant nozzle. Yep. And that's it. That's simple, right? So there's a lot more to learn about fire hydrants, so I'm going to go into that in a later video when we get more into the grade three, grade four stuff. Plus, there's just a lot of information as operators we want to know, we need to learn. Uh, especially people like George, who takes other members of our crew out to PM, repair, replace these fire hydrants. You want to know all the different parts, all the different functions, and what it takes to do all those things. And we'll go into that later.